This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for the suffering, the suffering podcast. podcast. Fear can be a very valuable weapon. The size of the destruction can pale in respect to the emotional impact. The psychological battlefield is fought within the hearts and minds of the intended target. Optics are every bit as important in a battle plan as a bullet. Through media and global attention, perceptions are rapid fire through the outlets. It's hard to escape the bombardment, attempting to wade through and find the truth. Showing fear in the face of terrorism ensures their victory. A terrorist will attempt to win the war through maximum visibility. The only defense is resilience and the strength to continue and fight. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice, and welcome to The Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you, because that's what we do here, and that's the stories we highlight. So do me a favor. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel. Please comment. Ring the bell so you can get notified of all of our new content, and now you can join. Follow us on all social media so you can find out what we're up to. On this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we have somebody traveling all the way from the city, another friend of Tom Smith. Uh, up, An- upstate New York. Upstate New York. Upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> Angel Masonette, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, boys. Appreciate the, you. So I asked, so t- when Tom was in here one day, and I'm like, Tom, do you know this guy? Do you know Big Rican Man? Do you know who he is? He's like, oh, yeah, he's like a brother to me. He's like, okay, oh, we're good now. We're yeah, good now. yeah. <laughs> Before we get into anything, let's throw a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust them. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. They keep the lights on. Let's support them. And they keep my father moving, too. <laughs> <laughs> his, his little Toyota that he got from I just got two more people in there. So listen, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do right by them. So, Angel, each week we take a question from our audience. This question comes from final underscore countdown. Now, you were a cop. And cops have to get out of their own mind, so you develop some sort of hobby. So Final Countdown writes, what was your hobby you developed in your career that helped you de-stress? You're our guest tonight, so I'm going to pass this one off to you. I moved upstate, right? <laughs> I moved to Orange County. So the, the story behind that is, is <laughs> if you live in upstate New York, you will differentiate yourself from those who live in the city. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and like I told you guys before, right, uh, Growing up in the Bronx, upstate for me was Westchester County, right? Yonkers was upstate <laughs> for me. That was my accent, Yonkers. Yank, um, my Yonkers. My Yonkers, uh, <laughs> city of Yonkers. It's I easy work. to slide back into right, it. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So I moved I moved about 70 miles north of the Bronx when my daughter was born. And um, it was about an hour and 15-minute ride. So my de-stress time was just... Looking forward to getting home to her, right? I'm a big music guy. I, I'm, I listen to everything from jazz, you know, to country, to my salsa, merengue, bachata, you know, my freestyle music. So I'm a big music guy. Um, just listening to music and thinking about my baby girl and getting home to her in one piece. Well, what'd you do when you get home, like on your days off and stuff? Did you have any, did you develop any hobbies? You play yeah, golf or yeah. something? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I hit the gym. I mean, in spite of what you see, right? I, I was <laughs> uh, in the gym. Um, you know, back then, uh, uh, I'd get on video games, you know, every once in a while. Um, I tried to, and it's a lot harder now, right, with social media and the world we live in. I tried to get away from the job and leave the job and flush what I went through because I worked in a, in a pretty shitty neighborhood. Um, uh, a lot of tragedy I witnessed, a lot of poverty, uh, a lot of stuff growing up, you know, same stuff that I went through. And um, just kind of de-stressing doing that, you know, um, I'd go for long drives again, right? Drives, my my dog at the time, I adopted a pit bull from the Bronx, right? Cliche as it is, right? It's the truth. I adopted, he was actually American Staffordshire. His name was Duke. He was 110 pounds. Uh, He was a big boy. Uh, I got him on a radio run and I took him home and I spent a lot of time with him. He helped me. Yeah, you know what? You you get involved in your pet's life. Like I t- I've always done that with my pets yeah. because no matter what kind of shitty day, they don't care. They're That's just happy it. to see you. Absolutely. I always say, my, no matter how bad your day was, my dog always ran up and pissed on my feet when I got yeah, home. Yeah, that's right. That's how happy the dog was. Hi, Daddy. I love you. Here you go. <laughs> now you got to get your girlfriend to piss on your feet. Little golden shower up. action. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> so aside from Pornhub, <laughs> Mike, what was your hobby when you were working? Really, like you said, I mean, music music is always an outlet. Yeah. Um, to me, it was just it, a lot of running. I used to do a lot of running back in the day. You know, and that was, that was just to clear my mind. You mm-hmm. know, I wouldn't wear headphones. I wouldn't do anything like that. I'd just go out and run, see the scenery. And well, there's a, point, there's a point when you're <laughs> running 
and I know this, that you just start, like, you, your senses become very awakened. Like, you hear everything around you. And with headphones in, it sort of drowns it out. Headphones yeah. are good if you're doing, like, a mile. Right. But when you start getting into the upper miles, like the six mile plus, you start getting in that zone. It's a, it's a great place to sit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah, and, and going to the gym, you yeah. know, working out just, you know, kind of the healthy habits, I guess. Yeah. You know, because the other habit, well, not habit, but, you know, the other thing, you fall into the bottle once in a while, you know, have a couple of drinks, and my father always told me, never try to drink your problems away, because the problems are going to be there tomorrow, and you're going to be hungover. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the, so that was one of my hobbies afterwards. It was drinking. And I was, listen, I was fully committed to my hobby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go hard or go home, right? So I, I would go out in my garage, and, like, my garage was my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And I would just create things. I'd do a lot of woodworking. Okay. I, I, I enjoyed working with wood because you have to stay totally focused on what you're looking at, and you can create something out of nothing. You know, you have this rough piece of wood, and, like, I created the, the – I made the bed uh, the headboard for my bed okay. um, out of just reclaimed two-by-fours, and it's got a very unique look to it. So you, when you do that and you finish a project like that, you feel very accomplished. But then, yeah. like everything else, you're on to the next thing. Or I'd work with metal or just create little things. I just needed something. And, and I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on it, but, you know, an hour, two hours in the garage, that was my, that was my personal de-stress time. Just, you know, I would tell my wife, just give me, give me a couple hours. Right. All right? And, and thankfully, she would. <laughs> so final countdown thank you so much for sending in your question keep sending in your questions we will try to get them on air and while you're sending in your questions why don't you visit one of our sponsors that's cubita cafe go to 234 franklin avenue in nutley mike right i was there today it was fantastic oh, um that chef gus gus, gus, gus puts is, his heart and soul in everything he puts everything into it yeah. you know he, he's got a whole career as a chef behind him um he's got very i mean the staff there is very attentive and the sandwiches were fantastic. They had a marinated steak sandwich that I had today. Oof. One of the guys had a Cuban sandwich. We had some empanadas. Oh, forget it. So he, he, one of the things with him, with Gus, is he refuses to lower himself and buy the pre-made empanada. Yep. So he makes all the stuff Listen, from hands. Listen, yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. So, Absolutely. yeah, you put that love and it, it shines through. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. check well, out. Well worth the trip. Check out Cubita Cafe at 234 Franklin Avenue and help them uh, help them. Get the word out. I want everybody just to go there at least once, and you'll be a fan. So, Angel, um, we've been watching you on social media for quite a while. We got introduced through a mutual friend, Tom Smith, from Gold Shield Show. Um, he, listen, he he says mostly good stuff about yeah, you. Most. Mostly good stuff. <laughs> the check clean. It, it, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so one of the things I'm really jealous about <clears throat> is your man cave that mm, you created. Yeah. So you got I don't know if you saw yeah. Mike. He's got football helmets back there. He's got the blue flag. You know, he got something similar to this back yeah, there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, it was that something that you had to have after retirement. So, oh, the recliner. Forget about the recliner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> so it was, but it took a while, right? Um, I I needed that space. I love my. I'm a big, you know, sports fan. Um, I'm not one of these guys. And I listen, thought you said you were a Cowboys fan. I am. That's, I am. Not, that's yeah. not a sports fan. Well, I'm a Yankees fan too. <laughs> there you go. Got it not. Yeah. So, Strike but two. <laughs> it was it, it was important for me to have that. Um, it took me a while to build up my collection. Um, I'm not one of these guys. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, you know, I don't watch the NFL. I don't watch basketball. I don't watch this. I'm not one of those guys. I love my sports. And um, yeah, it's my sanctuary. I finally got my wife to um, allow me to smoke cigars down there once in a while. Wow. I got a nice, uh, um, you know, the, uh, uh, air purifier system hooked up. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my little sanctuary. She had a quarter of it, you know, because she, God forbid, she gives me the whole thing from the beginning, right? Because she had the whole house is her woman cave. Well, yeah, if you right? if you get divorced, <laughs> she's not only getting a quarter, bro. Yeah, you ain't kidding. <laughs> Listen, this is wife number two. There ain't going to be a wife number three. So I've already been through it. Yeah, she took a quarter of it, and then she gave me, finally, I got the blessing to, you know, once I got my bathroom built down there, she was like, you know what, just take the whole man cave. And I was like, yes. I think women are really scared to do that with us because <clears throat> you get home from a long day. You know, obviously, you were NYPD. You get home from a long day. You saw something really bad. You're likely to go down there and sit in there yeah. all night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and if there's a bathroom down there, 
Oh, forget, forget about it. it. You got everything you need. And you a refrigerator? Got a cooler? Goodbye. That's it, yeah. yeah. So how many times you slept in a chair, it's right. not a big deal. Right. So full disclosure, I didn't have that man cave until recently. I didn't have that house until recently, right? When I went through, and, and we may get into this later, we may not, but when I went through my first divorce, my only divorce, thank God. <laughs> Hopefully my only divorce. We're still waiting on the right, second. Right, exactly. When <laughs> the I went jury's through, still out. When my, when my first marriage ended, I was broke as hell. So I had no man cave. I had no home. I had, you know, I went through it for a long time. So that's a, it's a scary place to be because you got a job that you're making at NYPD. You're making okay money. Yeah. 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 Um, but you're still broke. Yeah. We got friends like, uh, we, we got friends that, that we both know that are making on paper, huge amounts of money. Absolutely. Yeah. But they're broke. Huh? Because ex wives got it all and yeah, child support yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's right. So I'll stay out of that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Where'd you grow up? So I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, I'm Angel a Bronx from boy. the Bronx. Yeah, okay. that's right. I'm a Bronx boy, born and raised. Um, I uh, lived on 203 in the Grand Concourse. I lived on Morris Avenue when I was a baby, 183rd and Morris in the 4-6. Uh, uh, my grandparents lived in the Patterson houses over um, by Lincoln Hospital. That was my summer home, right? The projects. That was my. <laughs> You know, with the roaches and the piss in the elevators and all that yeah. stuff. And um, on the Grand Concourse, I used to hang out at Morris Avenue, 197th Street by Lehman College. And I'm a Bronx boy. The Bronx is the one borough that is sort of getting left behind. Yeah. Uh, you know, even Harlem now. Harlem is becoming, you know, all the – there's no more brownstones in, in Manhattan. Right. So right. I saw this when um, I ran the 2006. This is how long ago it started. 2006 New York Marathon, mm-hmm. and you're always a little. You have a little trepidation about running through Harlem because yeah. you've heard things, right, right, right. And I'm running through, and I'm like, boy, this doesn't seem like the Harlem that I heard about. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. really just sections, isn't it? It it is. Um, unfortunately, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the Malcolm X boulevards and the Martin Luther King yeah. boulevards are, are are unfortunately the ones that are. You know, uh, bl- in a blasphemous way, they're they're filled with the, the worst crime, yeah. unfortunately. So, I mean, that's basically where it happens, the bad stuff a- at that time. Now, to your point, you know, Harlem's no longer Harlem like it used to be. They're trying to bring it back because Harlem had its heyday. Right. You know, yeah, in, sure. the, in yeah. the 20s, 30s. Yeah. That, that was, it was high class. And it, yeah. listen, it was Cotton still, it was still, a, stuff, it was yeah. still a black neighborhood. Yeah, sure. But it was, I don't, it had an air of, uh, it had an era class to it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, yeah, you yeah. you went for a night out in Harlem. Yeah, yeah. They had the Apollo, all that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. And now, and then it went downhill for so long. It did. But I don't understand why the Bronx is still trying to catch up with the rest of the five boroughs. So, the the the, uh, the in my opinion, the main reason uh, for that is that you know, um, as Hispanics, right? Because the Bronx is predominantly Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican and Dominican, yeah. right? Yep, absolutely. Um, as Hispanics, we kind of left out of the. You know, we, we were kind of left out of the, 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 the black causes, right? The Black Lives Matter and all that other stuff. And then we were kind of left out of the white causes, whatever you want to say. So we were kind of stuck in the middle. Right. So since it's predominantly a, a, a Hispanic neighborhood, the Bronx, you know, we just... Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Hispanics, for the most part, we mind our business. Right, we mind our business. We, Those we, neighborhoods are the best to go into because yeah. they're the most alive. Right, believe yeah. It or not. We we want to work hard. We we we're big into family. We mind our business. We don't complain. We don't play victim. You know, so there's a lot of you know pride that's involved with that and keeping. You know, like my in laws still live in the Bronx and they have a, a four family house in the Bronx that's been paid off for years. And my my father in law was a bodeguero. He opened, he owned the bodegas his whole life. And the man came from Puerto Rico when he was 11 years old, and he's been busting his ass his whole life, and he worked to raise five girls, you know? So it's, it's, it has a lot to do with pride and keeping kind of that, you know, uh, um, the, the, the Latin flavor in the borough, you know? I really like what you said, that Puerto Ricans don't seem to play the victim, because when you grow up, and by the way, I checked his age. He's 53. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's Here right. Okay, I checked his age. Um, I think Spam's the only thing older than me. <laughs> <laughs> Puerto Ricans weren't viewed very favorably in this country. Mm-hmm. That has since changed, by the way. The, the, yeah. In my opinion, that has since changed. But I remember, I've said this on the show before, I remember growing up, and my grandparents lived in an area where this one, one of the sections was heavy Puerto Rican. Yeah. And I was told, yeah, you're, stay away from Puerto Ricans. forbidden right. to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, look at West Side Story, right? It was yeah. Yeah. Jets and the Sharks. It was Puerto Ricans against the Irish. So yeah. it, it's, but it's changed. 
I don't know whether mm-hmm. that has something to do with the natural ebb and flow of immigrants into this country. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, Irish were looked at it poorly. Italians right, were looked absolutely. at poorly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. But they found their way. Yeah, sure. So I think Puerto Ricans may have just found their way yeah. in yeah. this and, and become really immersed into American culture. Yeah, as you know now, right, uh, we're a territory. So we're all, you know, United States citizens, even on the island. The thing is, we were looked at as immigrants because we came here. And just like the Mexicans of the world and the Guatemalans of the world and the Salvadorians of the world and the Dominicans of the world, we didn't speak the language, right? So you come here and you have to assimilate. You have to work hard. My grandfather came here, right? Um, He was like 10 years old and he came here uh, from Puerto Rico on his own because his older sister lived here and he came to live with her. And he joined the army. He was in the Merchant Marines and he worked his way up. That's the big difference. It's, it's, yeah. They are hard. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, the yeah, hard yeah. workers that come over here. That's the big Absolutely. difference right there. You just hit the nail on the head because this was something that failed, even with it going back as far as the, when the Italian immigrants came in there. You had, like, my wife's grandmother, she'd been in this country 70 years right. before she passed. Couldn't speak English. <laughs> what, what does it matter with you? Yeah. You live in a country that's yeah. predominantly English speaking. But I think uh, when Puerto Ricans came over, they. They picked up English very, yeah. very quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they knew. Because they, they had to. Yeah, they they knew. Yeah. That's this is how I'm going to make my way this in this is country. It. Right. That's it. And my grandfather was uh, my grandfather Thomas Forner. Um, he rest in peace. He was uh, a huge right because my dad wasn't around. So my grandfather, um, he was a nasty old honorary man. But for me, he was the man, my man example. Yeah, so he exactly. was he was super hardworking. Um, he was a huge politician, right? He was a big politician back in, you know, the, the Kennedy days, you know, the Mayor Koch days in New York. Um, uh, my mother has pictures of him having dinner at Gracie Mansion, right, with Mayor Koch. He was a very, um, uh, very outspoken, right? Maybe that's where I get it from. But he, he was he was just a tough, hardworking dude that took care of his family, you know? And, and You can't ask for more than that. That's it. That's all he wanted, you know? Heavy drinker. Heavy drinker. Um, it's in my lineage right um the problems with alcohol so uh that was one of his that was one of his uh kind of uh downfall so to speak but he lived till he was 85 years old so he did okay that work ethic that was instilled in you by your grandfather is that what sort of led you on the straight and narrow and into eventually the nypd yeah he was a very big proponent of a uniform right his thing was whether the guy's wearing a janitor's uniform or he's wearing a postal uniform or he's wearing a police uniform or fire the guy deserves respect. You know, his big thing was treat the janitor better than you treat the CEO. And that was always his mantra. He, he was always, he was a unique dude. He would take me, we would go to the, there was a, a, um, a bodega underneath the dentist, under on the bottom of a dentist building um, on 143rd and, and Morris and 3rd Avenue over that area. And we would go and we would walk by that and it was a bodega and we would go play the numbers, right? He would play his numbers. And then we would walk down to 149th. <clears throat> he would take me to Banco Popular, the bank. bank. He didn't have a bank account. He used to keep his money in a safe deposit box. So he would make me count. The, he would make me count. This was like every other day. He would make me take the safe deposit box out and count his money in front of him. He would tell me, this is hard-earned money. I want you to count it. I want you to make sure I have the Feel same it. amount of money that the was there. Of it, than the yesterday. smell of it. Right. And then we would walk down to the methadone clinic. And he would make me sit there for about 15, 20 minutes. And watch the the drug addicts, you know, zoning out, doing the matrix. And he would always tell me, you know, this is what's going to happen to you if you did drugs. This is, you know, if they hit the ground, they'll die. You know, that yeah. was his thing. Because, you know, they were like, yeah, they, they would bend lean. over and that lean and they would never fall. Their head was by their knees. Right, right. And they right. never fell. So, he sounds like a great man now. Oh, he was. And, and, and my mother has different stories. And so does my uncle, may he rest in peace. And so does my aunt. Uh, my grandfather had different stories because he 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 was different, right? They were his kids and his wife, and he was different with them. But with me, as hard as he was, um, I'm a very affectionate dude, right? It, it, since I was a kid, I would always try to give him a kiss, and he wouldn't like. He would, I would hold his face, and he would like. He was afraid I was going to try to kiss him on the lips, but I would kiss him on the nose, the forehead. You know, I was always like that as a kid. He would watch baseball with me. You know, he had his newspapers piled up. Um, he was a great man, but he was tough. He was tough. But it's what you needed. Yeah. It's yeah. it's. Uh, do, you, you know, I, do you think he was tough because he didn't want to see you hit the streets? I think that he was tough because he had a hard childhood, right? And his thing was he'd go, you know, in the Merchant Marines, he'd go away for six months, and then he'd come back, and, you know, 
the checks will come in and he'd come back and then he'd drink and then he'd get, you know, he, he'd take it out on everybody. And then um, after he became, because when I was born, he was already in his 60s, right? So um, he was very like, you know, at that point he had obviously calmed down a little bit as far as, you know, the hitting went. And Plus the, your, the his grandson. Right. You know. So, and at the time I was his only grandson, he just gravitated to me. You know, we watched baseball. Like I said, I would sit in his recliner and, and watch the Yankees with him. And he was just very, you know, he, he was always, he knew my father wasn't around, obviously, right? Uh, my mother was busting her ass working. Uh, single mom, right? Bronx, you you name it. And but he, he saw just, too many kids like you. Yeah. Fatherless. Absolutely. Like you yeah. said, hit the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Get lost in the system. And I wasn't with him all the time. <clears throat> I wasn't with him all the time. Like I told you, you know, it was kind of funny, but it was kind of true. That was like my summer home. You know, I would, I would spend the summers with them a lot of the weeks in the summer when my friends were going to Puerto Rico, my grandparents were here. So I was spending, that was my summer. I was spending with him and my abuela and, and I'd be in the projects with them. But he wasn't with you all the time, but you were with, or, uh, reverse that. You weren't with him all the time, but he was always with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it is. But yeah. how did that transition into a police career? So it, it was always the uniform thing, right? You know, get a uniform, do you, get a uniform, get a uniform. Um, and uh, Which I think is an undervalued thing. Mike and I, I know we, we were big uniform guys. Mm -hmm. like yeah. you, were, you were sharp, Square you were crisp. Away. 100%. And um, the new way of policing, because we've had people in here have said this, and I don't agree with it. I don't mm -hmm. care. They, they, there's no case they can make. When you see an officer step out of their vehicle or come up to you and they are crisp and squared away and everything's shining and the boots are polished, it disarms everybody. Commands Absolutely. respect. Yeah. yeah, that's half the battle right there. Yeah. Getting out of that getting out of RMP, right? We call RMPs. I mm -hmm. get a lot of flack from my buddy who's a LAPD retired sergeant, Sal La Barbera. Uh, he says, what the hell is an RMP? Well, anyway, we call it RMPs. Getting out of that RMP, when you get out and you are squared away, your shoes are shiny, yep. your uniform doesn't have stain, stains on it, your shirt, and you're looking like you mean business, that's half the battle. Plus, I'm 6'5", you know, so, I mean, that didn't hurt, you know? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, yeah. that's a nice that little command out. process. Yeah, right, so. exactly. But now you you take mm. your height and you take your uniform, yeah. and that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. What? How old were you when you got the job? 21. Oh, you were, wow. you were fresh. Yeah, I was yeah. a little baby. You were a baby. Yeah, was good. I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> my Hector Lavo glasses, like they like to say, right? My my BCs, my birth control glasses. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, uh, um, yeah. I was twenty one, man. I was twenty one. I turned twenty twenty academy. Was uh was the job what you thought it was going to be? Like, what was the draw to being a cop? So I was, I was like, we like to say in the NYPD, I was full of piss and vinegar, right? I wanted to hit the ground running. I was like ready to save the as corny as it wanted sounds. Wanted to make a change. Yeah, yeah, like I'm like I'm Puerto Rican. These are my people, right? Because I grew up in a five two, and I ended up working in a 48. Now, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, when I went and I swore in, uh, I was in midnight class, January 30th, 1992. You know, we were sitting in Brooklyn Tech High School. It was 150 degrees and we were in suits and you raised your right hand and then you walked the gauntlet and it was like housing, transit, PD, housing, transit, PD, because they were three separate departments yeah. at the time. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't want to fuck. I don't want to go into trains. Right, I don't want to work the subways, and I don't want to work in housing projects. I spend enough time in housing projects. I want, I want to be on the street, running around in the cars. And sure as shit, I got my PD. You know, I got PD, and um, I was ready to hit the ground running. Right, I end up finding I was going on to the four eight, and I'm like, I'm gonna help. These are my folks, right? These are my people. I'm gonna You're help gonna Puerto Ricans. I'm gonna make a difference in the community where I, you know, four miles from where I grew up. And when you got that job, how did the neighborhood look at you? You're one of their own coming back. On, you know, I, I, what I know about the immigrant population, when somebody gets into that position, yeah. some people will look a little differently at them, like a traitor almost. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It was great. I mean, you know, I spoke Spanish. I wasn't great. I'm still not fantastic <laughs> speaking Spanish. I, I hold my own. That was another thing my grandfather used to tell me. Don't speak to me in English. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't learn Spanish. He made me speak Spanish to him. Um, he's like, you're Puerto Rican. He used to tell me, tu eres borico, tu tienes que hablar español. You, you're Puerto Rican, you got to speak Spanish. So I had to speak Spanish to my grandfather. He would not speak to me in English. Um, and when I got to the neighborhood, it was it was the height of the crack wars, right? 1992, uh, 1990. I got there January of 93, and the crack wars were basically, you know, they were kind of, you know, at their summit and, and almost on the way down. And, and I remember sitting in a dentist's office and looking at the cover of Time magazine and it said, smack is back, right? And that was heroin. Yeah. So it was transitioning from crack into heroin, right? And we had spots on almost every corner in the foray. 
literally. Like there was drug spots, whether it be weed, coke, you know, uh, uh, heroin, whatever, crack. There was a spot on every corner. So I hit the ground running. I went right to late. I, I did nine months of uh, field training in a foot post. Uh, got into a car once in a while, but then in September, I hit the midnights and I did late tours for eight and a half years. So, but it was good. It was good. The, the people accepted me pretty much right away. When you're navigating through patrol, was there any career path that you wanted to take? Do you want to become detective? Do you want to go some? You want to move up and become brass. So when I got on a job, all you needed was a high school diploma, right? So I had my high school diploma. Um, and in order to be a boss, you had to have at least a 60 credit, right? An associate's degree. So I wasn't going back to school. I just didn't have the time, right? So um, I wanted to become a detective. Uh, I wanted to end up in emergency services in a SWAT team. Uh, you know, I felt like, you know, I was built for it. I felt like it would have been a good thing for me, but I had no mechanical skills, right? I, I didn't know how to, I'm lucky I know how to change a light bulb, right? At that point, I didn't know, I knew how to change a tire on a car, but I couldn't, you know, a lot of these guys that are in ESU and SWAT uh, are SWAT, you know, they, they have side skills, right? They, they're mechanically inclined. I wasn't really mechanically inclined, but I wanted to become a detective, and I Could ended up a good breacher, if nothing else. Yeah, no, right. Exactly. exactly what yeah. I was thinking. I'm like, or yeah. a bullet catcher, right? <laughs> Sp sponge. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but you know, I ended up becoming. Thankfully, I became a detective. You know, but um, I love being a patrol cop. To me, patrol is the best kept secret on a job. Now, when when did you get into when? How long did you do on patrol? <clears throat> so I did uh, 12 years on patrol. Okay. I did eight and a half of those on midnights. I did. Oh, a you were on patrol during 9-11. Oh, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I did I did a stint of uh, anti-crime. I worked anti-crime for about a year and a half. That Amadou Diallo shooting happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the murder of Amadou Diallo, I should say. That was in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. that was in a 4-3. So when that happened, I was in anti-crime. Uh, the guys that killed him were in uh, citywide street crime, which was essentially the same thing, but just a citywide level. Anti-crime was borough-based, or precinct-based, rather. And um, once that happened... Uh, you know, every time I went to go toss somebody or jump out of my car, they were throwing their wallets on the floor because Diallo pulled his wallet yeah, out. He pulled his shot wallet 41 out. times. So I was like, you know 57. what? 57. Yeah. That's I, a it's Bruce Springsteen song. That's yeah. That's how I know that. Yeah, the 41 shots. And so he had 57 wounds, I believe, because of the ricochets and everything, but he was shot 41 times. So how, what, <clears throat> just back up, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on no, this no, no, because I, I have a perception of the Amadou Dali, Diallo shooting. Mm -hmm. And I always thought it was just a, a horrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. You know, he pulled mm -hmm. his wallet out. He couldn't speak English, all right. that stuff. Right. You you had just said that he was murdered. Yeah. Why, why, why do you say that? Because he was, right? They were they were looking. So you had you had guys that were young on a job that shouldn't have been in the position they were in. They were too young to be in plain clothes, unsupervised, riding around doing their own thing. They were too young. Uh, four white guys driving around in an African and black and, and Hispanic neighborhood. Um, and they were basically, they were, they were trying to look for a rape, uh, pattern and, um, they got this guy, they weren't trained enough, uh, and they jumped out on him and there was a language barrier and he pulled his wallet out and they killed him. They murdered him. I mean, that to me, there's a difference between, listen, you shoot somebody once or twice, that's an accident. You're shooting somebody 41 times. Look, I get it, right? Yeah. Contagious fire, all that other stuff. We can Sym go into- Sympathetic we can, fire. Yeah, we could go into phenomenons until the cows come home. To me, I viewed it as a, as a murder. You you viewed it as a murder because of inexperience. Not, correct, correct. Not the because, inexperience- Not and, because of ill intent. No, okay. no, no, okay. no, 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 no. Yeah. It was inexperience. I, I say murder, but if I want to get technical, manslaughter, right? Yeah. Because there was no intent to kill him, obviously, right? They thought they were defending themselves, and then the contagious fire took over, and then it ended up becoming what it became. Um, unfortunately, he lost his life. Um, but it, it was the NYPD's fault for putting these guys in that position. Oh, okay. They shouldn't have been in that position. But the, right? bra the brass don't take the fall for that? No, no, they don't, right? Because the, the, the grunts always suffer, right? Yeah. It, whether it's in the, the military cops? or whatever. Two got exonerated. One ended up becoming a sergeant. And another one got, fi another one got fired, did some time, did some time, I believe. Um, I mean, it, it was... No, I'm wrong. They all got exonerated. I'm confusing it with Abner Louima. They all got exonerated. Abner yeah. was the other one. They all got exonerated. Um, <laughs> we just talked with Tom Lillo, who did time with Justin Volpe. Yeah. Yeah, that piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said, he, he even said, and this was a guy who was fired for excessive force. Just so yeah. You know. yeah. So yeah. no, no, the guy we Oh, no, had I know what you're here. saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. And even he said, he goes, that Volpe guy, he's, he's yeah, fucked you're up. You're a fucking yeah. sociopath. Yeah. You do that to somebody. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it, listen, you go in this to tip, I understand, just to tip him. <laughs> but you go in. That's what she said. You go in elbow deep. There's a problem. Yeah. Listen, and and 
if you're in the room when it's happening and you don't do anything, you don't do anything. you're a fucking coward. You're complicit. You're, well, so you're, I, you're just as guilty. Absolutely, hundred percent. I ran into that several times in my career where somebody, you know, adrenaline what, a plunger. Pumper. Well, no, pl- no. I was going to say, you, you, <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, guys no, shoving no, plungers no. up people's ass. No, we never use plungers. Thank we use God. PR twenty four. Oh God, please. <laughs> um, where guys would get a little jacked up on adrenaline, you got oh, a hot yeah. call or something, and they throw a couple bonus shots in there. I was, mm-hmm. I was always very conscious of that because I, yeah. I, you hear me on the tape going. He's cuffed. It's That's over. Enough. Stop. You know, because I never wanted to. I, listen, I'm not yeah. going to go take hot dicks in the mouth for the next Absolutely five years. Not. For, for, so, for something stupid someone else did. Right. Yeah. 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 100%. So, and, and it wasn't to jam anybody up. It was it was my job. My job is not personal. Like police work, unfortunately, too many people take it personally. It's not personal. Yeah, it's can't. a job. You can't. You can't. And part of that job is being a senior cop. Right, which is a big problem with the NYPD now. Right, you got all these cops leaving through attrition. You got retirement. They go into different departments, and there's nobody to teach. There's no OGs on the job to teach these young kids yeah. how to talk to people, how to react. Right, a lot of it is jumping on a guy when you see him getting a little heavy-handed and fucking li- literally grabbing him and telling him, "Look, that's enough, man. The cuffs are on. The all bets are off." Like. You Stop. save them from themselves. Absolutely. Those, those days Absolutely. are over. Yeah, you can't. I mean, listen, besides the body cams and cameras everywhere, right, in this world, you can't you can't take a piss somewhere in this country without it being caught yeah, on video. Besides that, because I'm a big proponent of body cams. I love them. I think they exonerate cops more than they hurt cops. But the thing is this, right? Um, before body cams were out, you had guys like us that would jump on a rookie or jump on a guy who, we all had those calls, right, where you went to a call and the shit was about to hit the fan, and you and your partner calm shit down, and then yeah. you get back in your car, and you're like, imagine if so-and-so fucking was here. Yeah. It would have went crazy. Well, we had supervisors like that, too. You'd go up to a scene, and you, you know, everything would be calm. Supervisor oh, would they, come up, and yeah. they'd just start needling, needling. Oh, and my God. Shit. Horrible. Yeah. And then and the you, supervisor would leave. You watch, yeah. a, <laughs> you watch a guy on the couch, because I've had this, where you just you start seeing this. You start seeing the, the guy sitting mm-hmm. on the couch just doing this, and mm-hmm. you're like, he's about to go. Let's come. Let's let's deescalate. Right. Yeah. Because our job as in police work is to, it's not to fight. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Absolutely. But it's not to. It's to deescalate a situation. Yeah. Bring them in and yeah. try to get it done with as little effort as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I had a guy speaking at those clutching. I had a dude. Um. He was. He had just got out of jail. I mean, like. 16 hours before his old lady called us that she was beating the shit out of him. We get this. She meets us downstairs. She's like, look, he's a pretty big dude. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm young. I'm like probably 28, 29 years old. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a big boy too. Let's go. Let's see what's up. And I walk into this apartment and this dude is sitting on the couch in one of his international male G strings on. Right. (laughs) And he's sitting there and he's got his arms up on the couch and his muscles have muscles, have muscles. And his, I mean, his cock is hanging out. The guy is a fucking monster. (laughs) How does cock look? He's, it was big. <laughs> that, muscle, that muscle too. It was big. Yeah, it was pretty. It was impressive. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> hey, nice so, chunks. You get right. a salute. So Way to break the ice. So I walk in with my partner and I look at him and he's sitting on the couch and he's and he's fucking. He's like his chest is heaving and I'm like, this is it, right? We're gonna we're gonna go. So he looks at me, and he goes, I'm not fucking going back to jail. So I put my gloves on, right, the, the infamous black gloves, yeah. and I look at him and I tell him, look, we're going to go either the easy way or the hard way because, you know, you might get the best of me here, but there's going to be 15, 20 cops coming from three different precincts, and we're going to fuck you up. So get up, put your hands behind your back, and let's go through it. And, you know, he was like, okay. And he got up, and he fucking let me cuff him, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. I used so- to say all the time, it's one of two ways. <clears throat> That's easy it. way to the hard way. That's it. Yeah. The easy yeah. way is my way. The yeah. hard way is going to be That's your right. way. That's right. That's right. My son and I just had this discussion. We were talking about professional wrestling for whatever reason. Right. And we were talking about Andre the Giant. Okay. So think about Andre the Giant, somebody of that stature. Oh, the it. only way you're arresting him is if he allows you to yeah, arrest him. 100%. No doubt. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. how do you do that? You do that through your verbal judo. You do that through, through talking and, and being uh, kind and yeah. being kind, but being firm. Empathetic. Yeah. Everything. Everything. So you go on in your career, and what kind of special details? Because I know you were on JTTF, which yeah. is really what I, I want to yeah. talk about. Right, right. I, I chose to name this episode The Suffering of Terrorism because there's some big stuff that happened when you were on JTTF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, make a long story bearable. I, I did my 12 years or so on patrol. My CEO at the time, Barry Bazzetti, uh, who I love, um, he uh, took me off patrol, and he's like, look, every time there's a shooting, every time something happens, there's a homicide, whatever, they call up the squad and they're asking for Kojak, right? The kids in the neighborhood used to either call me Kojak or the Big Show, right? <laughs> so they call in up the squad. <laughs> you're, like the, you're like a mixture of both of them. I yeah, there you go. <laughs> need a lollipop, right, and right. a, a lollipop and a singlet. There you go. <laughs> so they'd call the squad 
And they'd ask the detectives, look, I want to talk to Kojak. I got some information on the shooting. And then the, the, the detectives would get pissed off, right? He's not a detective. You got to talk. Not that they'll get pissed off, but it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're kind of in their territory, right? And I'm a fucking patrol cop, right? Piss ain't patrol cop. So my, my CO, Barry, was like, look, go up to the squad. Give it a shot. Stay there 18 months. If you don't like it, come back to patrol. I said, okay, I'll try it. And the rest is history, right? I went up to the 4 8 squad. I did, I was there for three years. I got my shield in 05. And then in 07, um, I got, I got my story of how I got to JTTF is a funny one. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get into it, but I ended up getting to JTTF in December of 2007. So with the JTTF, it's, it's a highly sought after position. Yeah. Kind of. The most, I dare say the most elite unit in the Joint terrorism task force. That's right. right. Yeah. So Tom Smith and Dan Murphy were both involved in that mm -hmm. as well. And yep. I guess that's how you two connected. Yeah. Myself and Tom. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but what is that like? You go from this high octane, high adrenaline to a think, now a thinking man's game now. Yeah. yeah. Now you're all of a sudden, and you got to pronounce names that I'm not even going to try. No. Right. Yeah. And listen, full disclosure, I'm not as smart as I look. So it was, <laughs> it was a tough transition, but the worst, <laughs> the worst part of it, believe it or not. So the first, I shouldn't say the worst, the most impactful moment for me was I remember when I got, we had our, our officers in Chelsea right by the Chelsea market. And I remember uh, I was in a suit, right? Cause you got to wear a suit every day. And I woke up to the, and it was the day I was getting sworn in as a U.S. Marshal. Cause you get sworn as a deputy, you, you get deputized as well as a U.S. Marshal. So you can carry on the plane and you get your creds and yada, yada, yada. And I remember I had to take a shit and I'm like, this, this <laughs> it bathroom, always comes down to this that. This bathroom is spot. I was embarrassed to pollute this bathroom <laughs> with my shit. Cause it was fucking immaculate. Right. And then I look at my desk and I have my own, you work in a squad in the Bronx, Brooklyn, anywhere tough, you're sharing your, your, your desk with three guys, right, or girls. And they're slobs for the most part. And I'm not a slob. So I, I would used to get pissed off. I had my own, I had three computers to myself, my own desk. I had a take home car. I mean, I was like, wow, I made it. Like, my, I made it, right? Top of the world, Top right? Top of the world, my. Yeah, yeah, that's how I was. I was Jimmy K. You look at some of the things these people do post 9-11. You know, pre-9-11, JTTF was a very, very select few people. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it just grew after 9-11. Now, you got to look at the, the backstage, behind the curtain of what these people who perpetrate these terrorist acts are really like. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and I think one of the first times the world ever got to see what people, what, what the terrorists were like behind the scenes is when they killed Osama bin Laden and they started, information started leaking out, a bunch of porn pick tapes and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. So He's got 30-something kids, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're yeah. not these overly religious people as everybody thinks they are. Right. So what's the, what's the first thing that you really learned about these people who do these acts? So it's tribal with them, right? This is, this is tribal shit for them. This is not, this is not, this is like, uh, what was it? The Hatfield and the McCoys. Hatfields this McCoys. is the Hatfield and the McCoys times 2000 for them. Like their fucking great, 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 great grandfathers were fighting each other in the caves of Afghanistan. So this is personal tribalism shit for them. A Salafi Muslim, there's no, they will not rest until 100% of the free world is living under Sharia law. So these fucking people, when they get it in their brains that they're going to be Salafi Muslim extremists, they're a whole fucking different breed. Because listen, I had sources, I met imams, I met people who were Muslim who were fucking fantastic people. Well, Muslim, were, Muslim is a peaceful religion. They we're were not fantastic. Dumping on them. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. But, but to your point, the people that I was investigating in the JTTF weren't peaceful Muslims, right? They were... They were Salafi Muslim extremists. So the worst part was, to your point earlier, remembering their names, like trying yeah. to differentiate. And I'm not trying to sound like a buzzard, but it was tough. It's got to be with your tough. Western tongue. It doesn't work. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, and I roll my R's as good as the last, the next yeah. guy. But you know, it, it's, it's, it was, it was tough. Um, something that, on um, you know, again, right? I'm not as smart as I look, but you know, my brain was able to pick it up. And I ran with it, and I hit the ground running. I hit the ground running. with two. I got there in 07. I got my first big case in 08, and then I got my huge case in 09. So I hit the ground running. Those. The, so w what were they like behind the scenes, these people, aside from being absolute extremists? Um, because they were living amongst us. Right, right. and they still are. You had yeah. said something where a terrorist, there was, there was a couple 
character traits for a terrorist. They're incredibly hardworking. They're hardworking. They're good actors, and they're very patient. Yeah, yeah. The patience is, I agree with that a thousand percent. The patience is there. These people will wait. And listen, this is not, and, and, and folks, full disclosure, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but this is the truth. It's not a matter of if another 9-11 happens in this country. It's a matter of when, okay? They're going to hit us again. And they'll, they'll wait 50 years if they could kill 3,000 Americans in one day again. And now we have over 4,000 who have died due to 9-11-related illnesses after the fact. We, we just, just lost, lost one today. We just lost one today. There you go. You know, there Billy, you go. Billy Bartholomew was one of the guys from the Bucket Brigades cleaning out God bless Ground him. Zero. Yeah. Fought a hard battle with cancer. Yeah. Um, and the, so, the Droga Act. Yeah. yeah. So James the Droga. That's his, right. His father just passed away. That's right. Yeah. 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 So he got hit by a car in the hospital. In the hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you wouldn't talk crazy. Yeah. He, his wife had surgery. Yeah. He went to visit her in the hospital. He left, got hit by a car in a garage and got killed. Yeah. Former police chief. Listen, you don't know, right? God, when God, I'm, I'm not super religious, but I believe in God. And when it's your time, only he knows. <laughs> That's it. That's you try to be as careful as possible, That's but not it, right? overly yeah, yeah, cautious yeah, because right, yeah. when your numbers up, your numbers up. That's I'm not right. going to push God to turn over that other card. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I have a friend of mine. He's he's Pakistani. Mm-hmm. He's a Muslim. Yeah, and he fits the profile of a terrorist so perfectly that he. <laughs> I'm, uh, his name's a deal, and and he, you know, young businessman, highly successful, right, right, very right, smart. Right, right, right. He fits the profile so well. Right. And I always used to joke, I said, hey, how's Bin Laden doing with the rest of your money? Right. <laughs> uh, but he had to get special clearance to go on a plane, because every time he was going on a plane, he yeah, was yeah, getting he pulled in and yeah, getting a finger right. up his ass. Right, yeah, yeah, So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. how did you differentiate between the average, really successful Muslim mm-hmm. versus somebody who's doing bad? So our our vision or image of a, of a terrorist is a Western is a Western thing, right? Um, there's no, and and I hate to sound cliche, but there's no real profile of a terrorist. A terrorist can be anybody. I mean, look at the Sarnayev brothers, right, in Boston. Yeah. The Boston bombers. I mean, you, you look at that that Richard Reed asshole that went on a plane with the his shoes. shoe. You're right, yeah, the yeah. shoe bomber. Um, my Staten Island jihadi kid, Abdul Hamid Jihadi, he was a Palestinian kid. Right, um, Najib Bulazazi and his crew, Adis Madujanin, right, and uh, Zareen Ahmadze, Pakistani, Palestinian. I mean, a uh, uh, Bosnian, right? There's no profile. I mean, look at the asshole that blew up uh, Oklahoma City. Yeah, right. right. Timothy uh, McVeigh. McVeigh, right? Timothy McVeigh, terrorist, one of the worst terrorists ever. You know, didn't fit the profile, right? I get what you're saying, but so for us, the short answer is differentiating it is. We, there was uh, the biggest part of fighting terrorism is intel, is the intel you get right. Uh, you have good sources, you have people who help you out, right? Because the police cannot do their job effectively. I don't care what level you're at, whether you're a fed, or whether you're a patrol cop, right? In the worst neighborhood in this in this country, you can't do your job without the help of the the public and the community. If you don't get good info, if you don't get good sources, if you don't get good people coming forward and helping you out, you're not going to do your job effectively. So a big part of our thing was Intel, online stuff, which was starting to become more prevalent, right? This is pre-Facebook, right? 2007. I think Facebook came out in late 2007. Um, you know, the Instagrams of the world weren't out. We had, they would communicate on Pal Talk. This we, was the thing called Pal Talk. Yeah, MySpace, MySpace, which I fucking have, disappeared, right? Everybody's Tom. friends with Tom. Tom. Yeah, right, exactly. Tom, Tom yeah, he was, was your friend. friend. <laughs> yeah, your first friend. But Intel was a big part of it. That's how we differentiated it. The financial aspect, right? I had a guy that I went, a, a doctor uh, who owned dealerships in Texas that I went, and we found out he was laundering millions and millions of dollars to Al-Qaeda. I mean, you know, and the guy was a clean-cut doctor, like, and he owned car dealerships. So... The profile is it's easier to identify these people when you have good intel. How would somebody come up and give you a little bit of intel? So you, you got a source. Uh huh. Like what what was that conversation like? It was just like having a source who was a crackhead auto stripper, right? Um, money talks, right? You get they give you good info, you pay them, right? The the FBI had a good budget for every source that they had who gave good intel. They paid them well and they got good info in return. Um, the big thing is vetting it, 
right? You can't just take it. The guy just can't come up to me in the street who owns a bodega, who's Yemeni, and tells me, hey, you know, Ahmed over there is a, is a tier two Al-Qaeda operative. Uh, you know, go, you know, stick a camera in his house and, you know, bug his car, right? You have to vet the information. The more sources you have that come with you with the same shit, the more you know, hey, wait, we got something here. There's a little smoke there, maybe fire, right? The biggest part is vetting it. Right. So you'd have people that would come to you. A lot of it was word of mouth. You have people coming to you from mosques. Right. You have people that you meet um, that agents would go out and they would look for sources. Right. They would go out. The biggest part of the task force was the you know, and this is around the country, the Leos. Right. The law enforcement officers who were part of the JTTF. It was our job to work the streets and teach the agents. Right. Um, how to work people on the street in the hood. Right, because a lot of the agents didn't know that, right? They're smart guys. They went through Quantico. They're very book smart. A lot of them, unless they're former law, uh, former police officers who became agents, a lot of them are attorneys, you know, uh, uh, engineers, uh, you know, even doctors, and they become FBI agents, and they don't know how to talk to a crackhead auto stripper or a Yemeni guy who owns a bodega who wants to give them, you know, information about something that's going on that's nefarious. Well, I mean, you got to treat everybody with respect. 100%. You, know, you, you you get one of these guys, one of these intel, and you don't treat them with respect, you ain't getting shit out of them. Oh, forget about it. That's it. You're done. You burn that's, them immediately. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's why, you know, you get these books guys, book smart guys. That's why I always say, I, I take a street smart cop over a book smart 100%. cop anytime. All you time. know how to deal with people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Aside from the money, though, that, they, that you were able to provide them, there's got to be some reason why they give up their... Muslim brothers, mm-hmm. and I, I'm saying Muslim, okay? And right. I, I know that's not the only thing. I know what you mean. But why why, why are they giving up? Is, see, my opinion is is like um, in, in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, you see somebody screwing up mm-hmm. where it could give all Puerto Ricans a bad name. Right. You usually have some internal justice. And that's it. And that's it, right? To your point, right? They want to show us that, hey, not all Muslims are terrorists. Not all Muslims are out to kill Americans. Not all Muslims want to live under Sharia law and, and a Salafi. So you had people, and listen, there were various reasons, right? Sometimes I had a guy who was Bangladeshi. His kid got jammed up, right? He got radicalized online. He ended up, it was my last case before I left JTTF. He, he got jammed up. He was driving a cab and the kid got radicalized online and he took a plane into Turkey, right? And you go into Turkey, you're, you're going one place and one place only. You're going to Syria because that's the only way to get into Syria is through Turkey. The kid ended up in Syria. Right. Aleppo happened. All this other shit happened. And the kid was calling the embassy looking for me. And I had retired, um, wanted to get back. So the father helped us. The kid helped us. Right. You have motivation just like a scale. Right. In, in the street, an auto stripper again. Right. They, a lot of times they do it to save their own ass. You had some big cases, though. Yeah, I yeah. did. And the one case that, that, that we had talked about briefly is you foiled the last plot of Osama bin Laden. I did. Yeah, I did. You want to yeah. tell us a little bit about that? So it was called Operation High Rise. It was um, 2009. Our overseas partners and our intel partners, um, they get into emails. They get into things, right? Um, I can't speak as corny as it sounds. A lot of it is classified uh, till this day, and I signed an non-disclosure before I left, and I can't get into uh, Sorry, specifics. you signed one with us, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so Our supersedes that but, one. <laughs> so they were monitoring an email address. Um, which was known to have bad things attached to it. And fortunately, Najibul Azazi, so Najibul Azazi, Adis Madujanin, who was my guy, he was my part of it, and Zareen Ahmadzai, they went over to Waziristan and they went to a training camp, to an Al-Qaeda training camp, and they met with the number two of Al-Qaeda at the time. I forget the guy's name. Um, they went over there under the guise of uh, Adis was going to go marry Zareen's cousin, who was Afghani, um, and they went with uh, $3,000 as a dowry, right? A dowry is like, you know, you pay off, you could bring money, you could pay them with a cow, whatever it is, right? And I'm getting, you know, the cousin. Hopefully it wasn't a cow for a cow, right? But, <laughs> right, getting getting your cousin. So that was their, that was their guys, you know, that was their little uh, ruse that they had. Um, they ended up going over there um, through a facilitator. They got through what's called the Khyber Pass, which is an upper tribal area of Afghanistan. And it was the only way into... Was Ziristan at the time. Uh, my guy, Adis, I found out later that he almost got killed because they thought he was a plant because he was light-skinned. He was whiter than you guys, right? He was a uh, Palestinian, uh, no, Bosnian kid, right? Young kid, <clears throat> didn't look the part, to your point. He got radicalized online. He ended up hooking up with Najibullah. 
um, and Zareen, and anyway, they end up out there, right? They fly into Pakistan, they make their way into Afghanistan, and then they go over to Khyber Pass. They go there to the Al-Qaeda training camp. Um, they were there for two weeks together. Um, they were coming up with a way to do a terrorist attack, right? Um, similar to 9-11 on, the trains, on right? U.S. soil, right? Uh, they were going to bomb. They ended up settling on a suicide attack, like the London subway attacks. They were going to bomb three separate su- separate subways, a uh, suicide coordinated attack, um, and kill thousands of Americans, right? Uh, Zareen and Adis came back, and and um, Najibullah stayed an extra week to 10 days and got explosives training. He was going to be the explosives guy. So in his infinite wisdom, he wrote down, he took notes, right, because he was in class uh, learning how to build a bomb. And he went to what was the equivalent of a Kinko's at the time in the middle of Afghanistan. And he emails himself the instructions on how to build this bomb. Right? I always say if they were never, if they're not stupid, we'd never catch them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So he emails himself these instructions on how to build this bomb and it gets intercepted. So now our federal, you know, partners are high alert. So now they start putting out feelers. You know, does anybody know these guys? They're American. You know, two of them were citizens. You know, they were, uh, they had green cards, whatever the case may be. Um, Start looking out. They're putting out feelers, right? NYPD Intel uh, gets one of the leads cut to them. And they're telling them, look, we got to find out if anybody knows this guy, Najibul Azazi, because he's back and forth between Colorado and New York. He has a coffee cart down at Wall Street, right, which is a perfect place to put a bomb. Right? We got to find out where this guy is and where his, you know, anybody knows him. So now Intel puts out feelers to their sources. There was an imam named uh, Ahmed Weiss Afzali. Um, he was a source for NYPD Intel. Turns out he was like best buddies with Najibullah's dad. So he hears Najibullah's name, gets raised up, he calls the old man, says, hey, look, NYPD's looking for your son. Like, what the fuck's going on? So now all hell breaks loose. In the meantime, Najibullah is in the Homewood Suites in Colorado. He bought all this acetone, he bought all this shit, and he's making bombs. He's making little bombs. He's, he's trying to get, get it up, get it built up to where it needs to be. Um, he gets the call from his dad, from his old man. He pours all the shit down the drain in the sewer in the back of his apartment complex in Aurora. And then he fucking gets in his car and Denver JTTF jumps on his ass. And they, now they tail him. They got their gold bags and they jump in a car and they're driving from fucking Denver to New York. They're on his ass. <clears throat> he gets to the GWB. Um, the, 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 uh, the plan was we're going to get a dog to do a ruse stop on the George Washington Bridge and go through his car and see if we could scare him into giving shit up. So we come to find out later through obviously, you know, after the fact, 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Najibula says that if the dog would have found what was in his car, he was going to jump off the GW Bridge. That was going to be, that was his plan, right? That's how he was going to martyr himself. They do the ruse car stop, uh, Port Authority police. They had a narcotics interdiction dog. It wasn't an explosives dog. Um, the dog did his once over in the car. The guy had no drugs. They let him go. He had the detonators in the vehicle, but we didn't know it at the time. He goes upon his merry way. He gets to Grand Central Station, thereabouts. Um, again, gets the call from his old man, dumps the car outside of Grand Central Station, runs. The surveillance team loses him, right? He's on his merry way. Luckily, he left his laptop behind. So our folks in the bureau get the laptop, right? They confiscate the car. They get the laptop. Now we're mirroring hard drives. Now we got some good, there's some meat on these bones. Um, <clears throat> we get, the jock gets activated, the Joint Operations Center. Um, they assign everybody, you know, you got this guy, you got this guy, you got this guy, myself and another agent, Farbad Azad. Uh, we get assigned to Adis Madujan and he's our piece, right? We're going to execute search warrants. It's a Friday night. Two o'clock in the morning, we're executing search warrants all over the city. We did like 15 search warrants, right? We had guys going everywhere. I'm there. Um, we go to Whitestone, Queens. Search warrant at uh, Adisa's parents' house. He lived with his parents uh, and his sister. Do the search warrant, uh, kick the door down, whatever the case may be. The mother almost has a heart attack. 
take him out of the apartment. He's not cuffed. There's videos on YouTube of me in the in the elevator with him. We take him downstairs. Uh, now he's sitting on the hood of my G ride, and we're talking to him for four hours on the side of the White Stone Expressway, asking him what's the deal, why were you guys over there, what were you doing, yada yada yada. And he kept he stuck to the story about the dowry and the cousin, and yeah. So <clears throat> we made an agreement. We came to a gentleman's agreement that night, which is significant in the story. Um, he was talking about how you know Muslims hate the West. You know, how they're in everybody's business and they're fighting wars they shouldn't fight and they support the Zionists and yada, yada, yada. And I told him, I said, look, you're angry, you're angry, whatever the case may be, let's make a gentleman's agreement. We could talk to each other until the cows come home, but we got to make an agreement never to lie to one another. And he said, I will never lie to you. I said, okay, same here. So I told him, get your ass ready because Monday I'm coming back for you and we're going to go to court and we're going to talk. So... Four hours later, he goes back into his apartment. We're doing a search warrant all over the city. We got we got ugats, like the Italians like to say. We got nothing, <laughs> right? We got cock. Ugats. We got hot, hot smoking cock is what we have, right? So we leave Monday morning. I go. I show up at his apartment. He comes. There's videos on YouTube of me taking him out. I got my trench coat on. I'm. Mm-hmm. We get him in the car. I take him to Eastern District of New York. Uh, Bobby Lasada, may he rest in peace. He was a retired NYPD sergeant. He went over. He was a he was a, um, a, a marshal. He stands outside the door, and I got this guy in the box, and I'm in there for 17 hours with this fucking wow. guy, and I'm going at him, and he's trying to pray, and I'm fucking slamming my hand on the fucking you know I'm doing it because to me uh, perp is a perp, right? The same way I'm going to interrogate a crackhead who just killed somebody is the same way I'm going to interrogate a <clears throat> fucking terrorist who wants to blow up the United States. So I'm in there, I'm yelling at him, I'm, he's trying to sing, I get him pizza, he's trying to eat. We're talking 17 hours later, and Bobby Lasada wouldn't let anybody in the room, right? And I'm screaming at this guy, and, the, and the, 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 the DOJ, they got guys trying to get in the room, and Bobby Lasada wouldn't let him in the room. Finally, <clears throat> you know, we're going back and forth, we get a little bit of information out of him, nothing crazy, but we tie him into some statements, right? And it's a, it's a crime to lie to a federal agent. Uh, uh, 1001 is the violation, I believe. You can get up to eight years in prison for just lying to a federal agent. And I'm a federal agent, essentially, right? Because I got my creds. I got, I'm a deputized U.S. Marshal. So we got him at least on that. Because I know he's fucking lying. Boom. We let him go. Um, now we're going up on wiretaps. We're, we're all over the place with this thing. Um, we get nothing. Again, we're getting nowhere. So the FBI... Their plan was we're going to keep surveillance on them for six weeks and get them back. And I was not happy with that. And I told my sergeant at the time, who shall remain nameless because he's a piece of shit. <laughs> I told him at the time, I said, I'm not good with this. You know, I got we got to do something. And he's like, you can't and blah, 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 blah. So the facilitator, I don't know if you remember, I mentioned him earlier mm-hmm. in the story. He got um, what's called the Kanye of our three folks. Acuna is a battlefield name, right? Only your facilitator, your trainers, your handlers, and your co-cohorts know this battlefield name. It's called Acuna. He got, he knew because he was in custody, the ISI picked him up, the internationals, uh, the Pakistani secret police picked him up and through whatever interrogation methods they use in Pakistan, which is none of my business. A little different from here. Right, yeah. yeah. They got his Kanye. We found out his Kanye. Now, I can't say the whole Kanye. I could just say what's been released, the unclassified part of it. It was, uh, Muhammad was the first part of it. So now, I have this information um, through the CIA and through the Pakistani secret police, and I decide on my own, I'm going to use this somehow, right? Just like any good cop would do. You got an ace in the hole, right? I'm ready to use this, and I just got to find a, the right the right time Moment, to do it. Right? So now myself and this uh, uh, State Department agent, Craig Goldstein, we come up with a plan that we're going to go. Um, we wanted to scare him again, right? So he had two passports. He had a Bosnian passport and he had an American passport. One of the, the American passport had a page ripped out of it, um, which was a, a good reason to go confiscate it, right? He took out the page where he went to Pakistan. So um, I go to the apartment with Farbad, the agent that was with me now, who's now supervising the FBI, um, and I don't tell him anything of what I'm planning to do. We take the car, surveillance is outside, they know we're going to go hit the apartment. I got a uh, receipt for his passport, uh, warrant for his passports. 
So I go to the apartment, I go in, right? I take my shoes off, you know, because you got to respect their religion. I take my shoes off, I go in, and he's playing, uh, I forgot the name of the fucking game. He's on Xbox playing video games, right? His sister answers the door. Um, Adisi comes out, he comes out, hey, hey, Angel, how are you? And he's calling me, we're on first name basis. How you doing, big guy? What's up? Blah, 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 we're shooting the shit. I go, look, by the way, <laughs> go get your passports because we're taking them. And now he starts like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? You know, and I say, I got a warrant for your passports. Here's the warrant. I'm going to give you a copy. You have to sign it. And I want your Bosnian and American passports. So now his sister, who does everything for him, right? Because the Salafi people, they treat their women like shit. Anyway, uh, the family was a decent family, but the sister was doing everything for this fucking guy. So now she goes to the safe and she gets his passports. She gives us his passports. I look at him and I give him the warrant and I'm like, sign here. So now he signs it, and now I take it, and I give it to Farbot, the agent. Now I look at Farbot, and Farbot's looking at me like, you better not fucking do it, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Like, at that point, I think he's like, he knows that I, where I'm going. So I look at him, and I look at Farbot, and I go, what name did he sign? So he goes, um, I can't make this out. He goes, what name did you sign? So Adi says, um, I signed my name. I said, oh. You signed your name? You didn't sign your Kunya, Muhammad? And I said the rest of the name. And he fucking, it looked like I punched him in the chest. He literally got white. I've never seen this in my life. Literally got white, took a stumble back, and I thought he was going to faint. He, he kind of falls back and he goes, what do you mean? That's not my name. My name is Adis. And I said, no, it's not. It's Muhammad. Ba, 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 ba. And um, you're done. Right? So I start putting my shoes on. Angel, what do you mean? That's not my name. That's not my name. So now I go up to him. I put my arm around him. I'm a big boy, right? Um, he was a pretty big kid. I put my arm around him and I, and I whisper in his ear. I said, I know what you did. I got you. And I'm coming back for you, motherfucker. It's over. I leave. Get in my car. Farbod is like, my career is over. Mm -hmm. He's fucking, he's like, he's done, right? Because we're not supposed to use the, it was classified information. My thing was I'm on the dice, right? We don't know what we got. We don't know if these guys planted bombs. We don't know if there's an undicted coke conspirator somewhere planning on doing this shit. So I'm on the dice like any good cop would do. Nothing exceptional I did. I just rolled the fucking dice with the information I had, which I wasn't supposed to use. It was classified. But your anxiety's got to be through the roof because you got the burden of oh, knowledge. I'm, I'm going crazy, right? I, I mean, I'm going crazy. So I get in my car, I get in my G-Ride, we have surveillance on the house, so I'm not concerned, so now I'm heading home. I'm like, fuck it, it didn't work. An hour later, I get a call on my, on my phone, on my BlackBerry, right? This is yeah, 2009. Come back. Um, your boy just tried to do himself. I'm like, what? And I thought, right, because we're cops. We're always breaking each other's balls, right? This guy, uh, I forgot who made the call. He's like, come back. Adis just tried to commit suicide. I'm like, what? Where is he? He's in Queens Hospital. I said, I'm on my way, right? So you turn. I got no lights on my G-Ride. It's a, it's, a, it's a 2009 Ford F-150. And I'm driving, doing like 100 miles an hour, trying to get to this hospital to talk to this fucking clown. So as I'm driving, a highway cop pulls me over. Where, Because I'm high beaming people, right? He said, where are you going? I'm like, look, this is the deal. I give him the, the, the short version, the Reader's Digest. And he's like, follow me. Throws on his lights and sirens. And boom, we're heading to the hospital. He's giving me an escort. I get to the hospital. I walk in. I see him. He's on a gurney with a neck brace, right? And um, uh, two old OG detectives from JTTF. We're talking about 2000, uh, uh, 2001 JTTF guys. Uh, Bobby Murphy and Mike Carney are in there with him. And I look at them, and they were there with Farbot. Farbot is there, the agent. And I look at them, and I go, get out. This guy's mine, right? <laughs> so, so they're like, oh, we're just trying to help. I'm like, get out. So now they leave the room, and he's sitting there with his neck brace on. And I look at the nurse, and I'm like, take the neck brace off. Oh, we can't do it. I say, I'm telling you to take the neck brace off. She goes over. Oh, she takes the neck brace off. He sits up. I go, I'm going to give you a piece of paper, and you're going to sign this. This is a, this is. I'm, I'm going to read you your rights. You're going to sign this. You're going to waive them, and you're going to tell me what happened. Because remember, we made an agreement to never lie to each other, and you've been lying to me for a long time, and it's time to stop lying. So he looks at me and goes, okay, you got me. He signs it, and he gives me everything. And how he ended up in the hospital, after we left, he jumps, he runs out of the apartment about 45 minutes later, half an hour later, jumps in his sister's Ultima, Goes 100 miles an hour on the Whitestone Expressway, calls 911. You could YouTube it. He calls 911 and he says in, in English first, he says, this is a dece. We love death more than you love life. And the operator's like, what? 
what's your emergency? What are you talking about? Where are you? Where are you? Do you need a police, fire, or ambulance? And he's like, we love death more than you love life. And then he starts saying in Arabic, there is only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. He keeps saying that over and over in Arabic, and then you hear him crash. Boom. He goes like a 100 miles an hour, no seatbelt on. The fucking guy doesn't get a scratch, obviously, right? Of course. We get a fucking hangnail and we die, right, cops? This guy, 100 miles an hour in the back of a car, boom, you hit a crash. He gets out, surveillance is chasing him. And so they, they're, they, they're like behind him, far behind him. An off-duty Nassau County cop, don't quote me, might have been Suffolk, jumps out, sees the crash, jumps out, gets him at gunpoint, gets him down. SO gets there, they cuff him, they take him back to the precinct, uh, back to the hospital, and then that's... And you win. That's where we're and at. You win. And we win. We get everything. Um, the uh, geospatial people from the agency, they come, they get... Um, a lot of this is tied into the Osama bin Laden thing, right, about finding his courier. A lot of this was from this case. Anyway, long story bearable. We get all the information we got to get, um, and we end up going to trial. We get Najibula. We get uh, Zareen. Um, Zareen and my guy, Adis, end up getting two life sentences plus 95 years in Supermax. And good guys won. The burden of knowledge that you must have had throughout that whole. Because I'm listening to it, I'm like, oh, I'm 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 trying to remember that. I'm in, I'm we're in the middle of a show here, right, right. Uh, but the burden of knowledge you must have had, knowing that there are people you love in close proximity to this person, Absolutely. and and you can't tell them, hey, you're in some serious danger right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, that anxiety yeah, building up yeah, had to be no unbearable. It was insane, and the worst part, right, was because I had this Kunya. And I couldn't tell anybody what I wanted to do, right? Because, because listen, I mean, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna sink with the ship by myself. If I mean, what's the worst they're gonna do, right? Uh, I, I violated my non-disclosure, right? I gave, I used top secret information that we got through a facilitator, through the CIA, through the Pakistani secret police. What are they gonna do? They're gonna send me to the one, two, three precinct in Staten Island and put me on patrol. Yeah. I'll deal with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I didn't want anybody else to get screwed over with me, including the agent Farbad Azad, who. I couldn't give him this knowledge because it would have ruined his career. So we're, we are coming to the end of this thing and you got like a, it, it's, it's one of those stories. Like, thank God there's people like you who know your job so well and are so exactly. driven I appreciate that. from, you yeah. know, the way your grandfather, I got to tell you what, your grandfather might be my new favorite person. <laughs> he, he just, I just yeah. love that. My style. mama, my mama raised me, man. I love that my, my style of, of, yeah. of teaching a man to be a man. Yeah. 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 To your NYPD career, which seems like it was a, it was an absolute joy and something you really loved. I loved it. To finally foiling a second 9-11. Yeah. Um, you've had this amazing journey. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? So, um, not, not your home address. Right, right. okay. No, 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 no. And <laughs> no, if you my give me your home have... address, yeah. guess what? Some of that shit in your man cave's going. <laughs> yeah. Especially the chair. So, uh, so um, on Instagram, I'm Big Reekin Man, right? That's me. It's because right? you're Irish. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, exactly. 6'5", 285, give or take a cheeseburger. <laughs> um, I'm Big Reekin Man on uh, Instagram, and I'm Big Reekin Man on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter. Um, that's my thing, right? I advocate for cops on, on social media. You've seen my stuff. Yes, I have. And we're going to put a lower third for all that stuff because I want all of our audience to go out and follow you because some of the truth that comes out of your mouth from experience is second to none. I appreciate and, that. And I, I love, I, I look forward to what you're going to do because you are one of those rare individuals who are willing to step up and in front of the bullet. Thank you. And, and even, you know. Yeah. Not, not figuratively, figuratively and yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've gone through all this, all this, this life of law enforcement and protecting this country, which I know you love. Yeah, I know you love, and you've gone through a certain amount of suffering, and I'm sure it's it's been weighed on your family and in every relationship, and that burden of knowledge I spoke about. What do you think all that suffering has taught you? All the suffering taught me, and the most pivotal moment in my career, uh, besides, or the most painful moment in my career besides September 11th was my first partner on the job, Francis Vasile, committed suicide in January of 1996. And I named my daughter after her. She was my first partner. And I get emotional thinking about it. It's been 26 years, something like that. Um, love her. And what I went through taught me that I matter, right? I've been in deep, dark places. When I got divorced and I couldn't see my kids every day, I was in a bad place. Um, I know that I was that I was here, put on this earth to do something great. And, and I did it. And I did it. 
um, and I'm still uh, working, right? I work for a private company now in corporate security. Um, I'm needed and I'm wanted and I'm, and, and I'm loved, and I know that. Well, you definitely want it here. Yeah. Appreciate well, you. Thank you. Well. I mean, you're incredible. I mean, I was thank just you, sitting Des. there. I, we didn't say much. It just, it, <laughs> Sorry. just kept talking a little. Well, it, was like, it was like watching a movie. I didn't want to yeah. inter- exactly. I didn't yeah, want to yeah. interrupt it all. Yeah. Great story. I appreciate Andrew. you guys. Thank listen. you so much. Thank you so much. My honor. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast, the Suffering of Terrorism with Angel Masonette. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned. Or Kojak. Co- <laughs> Co- big Kojak show. Sh- big <laughs> slash big show. <laughs> Find a place to de-stress yourself. This is a job, and it's not personal. Be careful with profiling. That's, that's yeah. a pretty big lesson right there. Yeah, yeah. The burden of knowledge can bring anxiety, but most importantly, and most importantly, protect what you love. That's right. Amen. And that's going to do it for this episode. Don't forget to go to popple.com, put in the code TSP20 for a 20% off your digital business card, and visit the Oakley at 789 Bloomfield Avenue in Nutley, New Jersey. Great food, great fun, great atmosphere. Follow us on all social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Clapper, well, X, Clapper. OnlyFans. <laughs> 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 and follow Mike at OnlyFans. No, follow Mike at Mike underscore Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. We're going to see you on the next episode.